Hi friends, welcome to the 12th session of Inspiring Conversations. My dear friend Tony Ashai is a celebrity architect who operates out of California and Dubai. Being from Kashmir, Tony has fond memories of his father. Tony's father recognized his son's passion and supported it by arranging for him to attend the classes at the local art school. His passion for art later led to the discovery of a new career and creative outlet in architecture. At the tender age of 16, Tony left Kashmir to study architecture at the acclaimed French Modernist School. The ultra-modern environment of the Progressive Architecture School was a sharp contrast to the town in which he grew up. On graduating, Tony travelled to Buffalo in New York. While sketching at a local monument, Tony met Robert Shibley, the Dean of the School of Architecture. Professor Shibley was so impressed with his talent and realistic rendering that the Dean suggested Tony to sketch for his feasibility study on the development of downtown Buffalo in exchange for the opportunity to earn a master's degree in architecture at the State University of New York at Buffalo. Following his graduation in 1986, Tony spent six months in Europe studying human behavior in urban spaces, the scale and volume of urban space and its relationship to human psychology. From 1989 through to 1992, Tony Ashai worked on the renovation of the Chrysler Building for the architectural firm of James Barclay & Associates in Manhattan and in Los Angeles with Edward Carson. In 1993, Tony formed Ashai & Associates in Torrance, California, an architectural design firm. In an effort to ensure that his designs would be completed as he envisioned them, in 1995, Tony established a construction management firm, Ashai Construction and Development, as well as a new design firm, Ashai Design Corporation. In 2006, Ashai Design Corporation expanded internationally, securing large-scale projects in Pakistan, India, Dubai and the world over. One year later, Tony opened Ashai Design Corporation Dubai as the Middle East office. The company offers architecture, interior design, master planning and landscape design related to various services. In the United States, the name Tony Ashai is a benchmark for excellence in luxury residential design for all of Southern California. And today, the same exceedingly high standards are being applied to gated communities, resorts, malls, five-star hotels and tower developments world over. When Tony isn't working, which is very rare, he spends time with his lovely wife Jamila and two children at his self-designed Tuscan-inspired estate overlooking the Pacific Ocean. He loves art and enjoys painting in his free time. Friends, this is the celebrity architect and designer Tony Ashai for you and let us enjoy our interactions and questions to Tony Ashai. Let's all enjoy the 12th session of inspiring conversations together. Thank you. Good evening, friends. We have a very interesting personality amongst us tonight. Tony, how is it uh, being a brand in the industry that you run? Because as entrepreneurs, we are all brand ambassadors for our business. But in true terms, you are a brand in the line of activity that you do. And you shuttle between California, Dubai and rest of the world, including India. I will not take the other country's name. People might not be very happy with that. But uh, how, do, how did you reach these heights as an entrepreneur? Um, first of all, I want to thank you for bringing me over here. My and pleasure. And thank you for introducing me to these lovely people. And when I walked in, I was told there's going to be a gala dinner. There's going to be like big tables with a lot of flowers. And when you introduced me, the commissioner for income tax. Now I know why it's low key and low profile here. <laughs> so, so I understand, now I understand the whole uh, idea behind the low profile thing. But I, uh, but I do appreciate and uh, I'm happy to see uh, wonderful people here. And I commend you for uh, what you do and I learned a lot about uh, um, him uh, over the last couple of days and uh, I, I found out that this whole thing is uh, for, uh, as a social service uh, for uh, inspiring young people and, and I think it's a, a commendable job that you're doing. I, I, I commend you for that. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you, Tony. That's so nice of you. Yeah. Thank you. 
So, um, the question you asked me, how, does, how do you do it um, uh, between LA and Dubai? And uh, I guess, you know, when you are passionate about what you do and uh, when you enjoy what you do, it's uh, never um, a burden, it's not a work, just like you. Uh, you work 24 hours a day. Um, I work 23 hours a day because I'm a little bit older than you. I need one hour sleep. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I don't get tired. I enjoy, I actually get great sleep in the airplane. Uh, 16 hours flight between Dubai and LA. So I get to uh, sleep. It's like a cradle, you know, when you're a little kid. So the plane moves like that and you sleep like a baby. Actually, that's the only time I get like 10 hours sleep in a stretch. But, uh, yeah, so I enjoy it. So being an architect, I think whenever you have a client, it first begins with a thought, then it converts to words, then it converts to action. But many a times, there is a gap between all these three. How do you manage that gap? Well, being an architect is not easy uh, because um, architects um, are like artists, but we are commissioned artists. There's a difference. So we have a certain responsibility. Uh, when I am being hired by a developer like yourself, you have a certain idea what you want to develop. So you don't go to architects like him or, or that gentleman sitting over there or me and say, come up with something. There are too many um, restrictions. There is uh, municipality rules. Uh, we don't know what we can build. They know exactly. They give us the height limit, the setbacks, and all these other things. FSI, a very a popular term in Bombay. We, <laughs> so, we really know it to the square <laughs> centimeter. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, so we get into those things, and then there's also economics of the project. There's also, uh, if it's a real estate development for sale, what will sell? Uh, what do people uh, like? What's affordable to them? So there's a lot of all these elements. So it's, uh, it's a process. It's a process that starts with... Uh, with conceptualizing um, your ideas. So I don't come up with my idea. So I've always used the analogy of a chef. I've always used that. I, as an architect, am a chef. I am not a Michelangelo. I'm not a creator of, uh, of the, the earth and the mountains and the trees and the animals and the people. I'm a chef. So you come to an architect and you order. And if you order uh, a, a steak. Now, it's my job to make the best steak for you. If you order a vegetarian dish, Indian dal, dal makhani, I can't force you to eat steak, so I have to make dal makhani for you. So, that's, so it's a little bit different as an architect. So that's how we, I, I take, I, I use the approach that it's you who's hiring me, not me who's imposing on you. So that's been my philosophy throughout life. So do you interview the client before you start with the assignment on what he wants, what are his needs, whether you could reach them, whether you could match them? So what do you do exactly? Do you interview the client in the beginning? Well, it depends on what kind of project it is. If it is a home, uh, which I used to do a lot of homes before. If it's a home, then you, uh, I ask people to... Uh, describe their home. I don't like to tell them that I want five bedrooms, four bathrooms. And I'll, I tell them to describe your home. Describe by, by that I mean uh, visualize it for me as you walk into the front door. What do you see? Do you see a two double height lobby with four staircases going? Or do you see a, a corridor that goes straight? Do you see, well, what do you see? So explain to me. A lot of times people would write, so, and then I, that gives me a, a window inside their brain. I understand exactly what they want, and that's how it would come. But when it comes to development projects like a building, there's generally a design brief that's already prepared by the developer through their feasibility studies and everything, so they exactly know what they want. They want uh, one bedroom that is 500 square feet, cannot be 510 because their numbers don't work that way, <laughs> or cannot be 480. So you can have corridors cannot be more than 12% of your total area. So all these things are given to us as a design brief. So we take the design brief, and then we create uh, the project or create the concept. The objective of 
inspiring conversations is we want to learn how you do your business efficiently so that we can get tips on how we can improve our businesses. Business is all about people management. How do you manage your team? Because after meeting the client, you might just catch a few lines and then off it goes to your team. So how do you ensure that your team which has been selected performs the way the client wants and you have, envis you have envisioned? How do you do that? It's very simple. I tell them I'm God <laughs> and you do exactly what I tell you to do. <laughs> no, uh, you, uh, you know, it's a team effort. You know, anything you do and when I look at my staff, I don't look at those people as if they are my workers. I look at um, uh, them as talented people whose talent I'm hiring for a certain period of time during the day. So I give them a lot of respect, number one. So I treat everybody with respect, whether it's a driver or a peon or a T-man or chief architect or a landscape, I treat everybody with respect. And, um, and a uh, lot, lot of young people, I like to inspire them, so I, I bring them in the conference room, I kind of teach them, hey, look, this is how you have to do. So I think, um, and, and when you have a person on the top who is passionate about what they do and also knows everything that you know, so there's a lot of um, uh, people start following you. Uh, if you are just a, a namesake architect, if you, are, if you don't know how to design, there's a lot of people like that in my profession who are uh, just namesake. They just happen to be at the right place at the right time and they, are, uh, there. they don't have a lot of following. So in my case, I've been fortunate. I started as an artist, then went into architecture so I can I can work, I can sketch, I can draw, I can design, I can communicate. So people look up to me and, uh, and that's how we put them all together. So once you hire your team, how do you train, retrain and retain them? Um, retention is very easy. I tell them that um, you will always get paid more than you will get paid anywhere else. <laughs> Here you will always get paid more than you will get paid anywhere else. So who wipes the customer's uh, tears? <laughs> so, because so ultimately it's come, it comes from there <laughs> yeah well fortunately I charge more than most architects will charge so <laughs> so I have cash flow to support it Excellent. so when person hires me for an architect charge X I charge more and because we work on the design and we just don't rush things and we don't take a lot of projects so we don't we don't go into we're not like a factory you know we whatever we want to do we want to do it nicely otherwise we don't want to do it so what is your practice of hiring new talent? Because whoever comes in needs to come with some caliber which matches your expectations. So do you follow a process to select the teammates? The team is very important, especially in a professional uh, field like yours. So what is the process of hiring a new talent? Well, first of do all... Do you get involved in that process or you have delegated it to somebody else? No, I have delegated it to somebody, but I give them directions. Like, for example, I'll give you, an, uh, you know, my office, I want my office to be represented by every nationality in the world. So wherever I go, like I'm in L.A. in my office and we have people over there. If I see there are not many Chinese people here, so I tell my HR people, next time you hire, can you hire some more Chinese people? So if I see uh, there are not many black people there, so I said, make an effort to hire black people because not many black. If I see not enough gay people, I say, make an effort to hire gay people. So I want, like, even in Dubai, it, our office is like, a, like United Nations. There's Indians, there's Pakistanis, there's Sri Lankan girl, there's uh, Filipinos. Uh, so we try to not make like one group, you know, because we're international and this is the world's uh, full of beautiful people, and and I'm definitely not prejudice. I, I look at everybody equally. So I try to hire all kinds of people. So that would be my criteria to them. And then I like to hire people from college graduates. So I would... Fresh minds. Fresh minds. Because then I could mold them in the way that I want them. So I will always have fresh people coming into the office and who we say, okay, you know what? I sit down with them. I tell them, I don't expect anything from you. I want you to get trained. So, uh, so they sit there and they learn, they get trained, and then they move on, and a lot of them would quit the job, go somewhere else, and I don't feel bad about it. I feel like, okay, we gave something to them. So, um, so that's how we do it. You know? 
Timing in business is very important. So how do you do time management? Because a client always expects something day before yesterday, and a professional tries to achieve it, but it always after happens day after tomorrow. So how do you manage that? Where, first of all, uh, what I do is commitment. I do not give commitments that I cannot meet. Very simple. If you tell me that I want this project to be designed in two days, I'm telling, going to tell you, sorry, we cannot do that. So um, then you're going to have to go somewhere else. Or you, if, if the project will require 10 days to design, I'll tell you, it give us 10 days to design. And then in 10 days, we'll manage the time. We work day and night, architects sitting in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. We just don't sleep, you know. We, we're like uh, night mongers. We just work at night. And uh, we meet the deadlines. Uh, I work with them. Uh, I'm always in the office till midnight, one o'clock. I don't get much sleep, but we get the job done. So the journey from Kashmir to California, was that instrumental in your growth that you had a global vision, you work in multi countries, uh, different language speaking countries, different languages of people. Did that help? And what would have been uh, with Tony Ashai today if you would have been in the same country? So from Kashmir, I went to Punjab, and everybody told, Chandigarh. Chandigarh, everybody told me they be careful with Punjabis. They're really mean people and bad people and everything else. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're loud and, you know. So I went, I was really scared, and, and I had no clue about Punjabis. I, first, first time I found out that you don't eat rice for lunch or dinner, you know, because in Kashmir we eat rice for lunch and dinner, and, and they served me uh, some vegetables, and they served roti. I said, no, I don't want roti. I'm waiting for rice, and rice didn't come, so I didn't sleep, I couldn't eat, you know. So it was very difficult adjusting, but then soon I realized Punjabis are beautiful people. They are fun-loving, they enjoy life, they live life. So I realized that everything my parents and everybody else taught me was completely wrong. Punjabis are good people, I enjoy their company. Then I went to America, Punjabis told me, be careful with Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are mean people, they don't, you know, they don't have family values, and, and they are like, you know, women sleep around with men, and all this other stuff, you know. So I said, okay, so go to America. And I realized that Punjabis were wrong because Americans have values. <laughs> and, uh, and then from America, I went to Arab. And Americans tell me, Arabs, you know, stupid people, this, that, whatever. You know, they had these notions about Arab people. They're not intelligent. They wear flip-flops and walk around in their big white overall. And, and then I reached Arab and I realized that people are really intelligent and they're sharp. Businessmen, they negotiate and they, are, they have same family values. So the journey from Kashmir, so I think if I was born in California and raised in California, I would be a completely different person. I think growing up in Kashmir and going through this whole thing, I realized that the people are same everywhere. And it's funny that we have a fear of associating with another person or another culture. And in the end, there is really no fear. I have two beautiful children right now, and I tell them, I said, whoever you want to marry, just make sure that uh, that's a decent person. That's all I care about. <laughs> Fantastic. So the journey from Kashmir to California to Dubai and back to the other countries has been an interesting journey for you. Yes, absolutely. What are the challenges you faced when you try to work inter countries? Because they have different rules, regulations, cultures, climates, languages. As an entrepreneur, what are the challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? Um, I think if you have respect for the other culture that you're dealing with, if you don't, if you, like if I come to India and I start pointing finger at everything that's wrong here, um, I would have a terrible time here. I would not be able to live here even for two hours. I'll take a flight, get the hell out of here. But I understand why things are the way they are. So I don't look at those things, and I just come in and I respect if there is a Hindu festival going on, and, or if I go to a house and their culture is take your shoes off outside, I don't ask questions, I take the shoes off and walk in. So I believe that if you have respect for your clients, and you don't look at them as what your parents told you, you know, they're bad people, they're not smart, they're this, just if you erase all that memory, what your culture, what your people, parents have told you, and you treat people one-on-one, -on -one, and if somebody says, um, I eat with my fingers, 
and I'm not going to look down upon him while I'm eating with fork. I'm say that's his culture, and I respect that. I think if you have that attitude, you will have absolutely no problem working with people across the globe, no matter what culture you go into. How do you adapt to the legal aspects of working in different countries? In terms of uh, from the financial side, from the permission side, how do you adapt to those challenges? How do you overcome that and what is your turnaround time in overcoming? Like tomorrow you go to a new country which has some specific rules for architecture, for development. You have that different rules for transferring money in and out. How do you manage those aspects? Do they trouble you or you will leave it to the professionals who do it on their own and they, they advise you how to do it? How do you do it? I, um, I mean, I just tell everybody, I give directions. I don't really get involved in, in that kind of a thing. I have a general manager that's handling Dubai office, for example. So I just tell them that make sure that you don't do anything illegal. Make sure we, don't, we follow the law. We have lawyers. The lawyers take care of that. And uh, give you an example. Um, in Dubai, if you sign a post-dated check and that check bounces, <laughs> they put you in jail. <laughs> right? <laughs> so... When I found out, so I said, first, our company policies, we never write a post-dated check because we don't want to go to jail in Dubai. So these are the things, you know, you, you learn and you have the right people. There is a lawyer who will give you advice on law. There's an accountant, even though in those, every country there's different tax laws. And then we have accountants, CPAs in U.S., that gives the advice on how if you make money over there, how do you transfer, all that stuff. So try to follow the law. So as a young man, when you went to California, you didn't go there to study, you went there as a tourist and you got admission in a college, you didn't have money to pay the tuition fees, you didn't have the money to live in a house, so you got a scholarship, the dean was kind enough to give you a seat, at the same time you started working and you funded your own education. So did that episode create a strong emotional quotient in you and what do you do with that emotions today? Um. Yeah, I think there uh, it does have a very strong impact on you. For people, I, I think of people um, like my children, for example. You know, uh, they don't have to go through that struggle that I went through. Uh, even though I didn't have to go through too, if I had stayed in Kashmir. You know, we're pretty well off from Kashmir, so we didn't come from a, uh, a poor family. So, but I chose to go on this path on my own against the wish of my parents who told me that if you leave, you're going on your own, we're not gonna, you know, so I said, okay, I'll leave. I gotta go and find my own uh, destiny. So um, uh, it does have a huge impact uh, on your psyche. Uh, you kind of, um, I think the, a friend of mine um, once told me this, the, the difference between immigrants in America and people who are born raised in America is that immigrants have a reference point and the reference point is the day you came to that country. Or it could also apply to a person who's self-made. He has a reference point. The reference point is that he was poor. So that's a reference point. When I was 25 year old, I didn't have a bicycle. I used to take bus. So that's a reference point. And then when you go through life, you, uh, when you are in economic troubles or you're in any kind of a financial situation, the business not good, uh, recession, you kind of always refer to that reference point in your life and say it can't get worse than that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it kind of gives you hope versus if you didn't have that, I don't know how you would deal with that, you know. Don't you consider yourself lucky of being at the right place at the right time? You are sketching in a place and the guy standing next to you happens to be the dean of an architectural college and everything is, it's so picture perfect, it's like script of a movie. So you, you, don't you think you are being lucky of being always at the right time, at the right place? Uh, actually, I always say that's the story of my life, <laughs> to be at the right place at the right time. Um, I don't know how it happens, uh, like they say, God's watching over you. I have so much faith that if I walk on this stage and I'm supposed to fall down, somebody will put something underneath and I won't fall down. This is the faith I have. So I, I, treat, I have friends who are the kings and I have friends who are drivers. You know, I treat them all the same. Um, to be yeah, at the do the kings know that? Uh, kings know that. <laughs> and as a, as, a, as a matter of fact, like a friend of mine, he is... Uh, uh, he's a king of a, a small country. And, uh, I know he, that country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, first time I met him, 
So he took me to his office and he says, you're pretty straightforward. I'm like, yeah. He's like, uh, so what do you think is wrong with my system? I said, your system sucks. It's the, most, it's the worst system I've ever seen. So he's like, really, what should we do? So we started talking and all of a sudden he became my friend. He says, you're the first person who come, uh, come and told me on my face because everybody out here, they don't say what I want to hear. So I treat everybody the same, so it doesn't really matter and that's how it goes. Uh, Tony, you have worked for the very rich and wealthy people and you have worked for the very rich, wealthy and powerful people. What is the difference? Between rich, wealthy and rich, and the, wealthy and powerful? Yes. Generally, when and they how are do rich, you handle them? <laughs> generally, when they are rich and wealthy, they are powerful. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? So, I, I mean, I, I have yet to come across somebody who is rich and wealthy and is not powerful. So... Uh, uh, I would say there's definitely they have egos, uh, which is bigger than anything else. And definitely they don't like um, anybody telling them the truth. Uh, example, I'll give you, I, was, I had a client doing a huge project for him, about two and a half billion dirham project. And I could see he was completely screwing it up because he didn't come from real estate background. He was from... Uh, a fashion background. So one day I called him to my office, I told him sit down, he said, I said, how much money have you invested in this project? He says, 100 million. I said, of your own? He goes, yes. I said, if somebody gives you 75 million, take it and run. <laughs> He's like, what do you mean? I said, you are going to screw up this project big time. Take the money if somebody gives you, go home and make clothes which you are good at and you can double, triple your money. Here, you're going to lose money. So he got really upset. He left. And next day, he called me. He said, I want to take you for lunch. He goes, I couldn't sleep all night. And this is a multi-millionaire guy. And he says, I couldn't sleep all night because I think in the back of my mind, what you said was true. <laughs> so, so finally, he's in the process of selling that project right now. I think the deal was be signed today. So he is out of the project. So I just tell him the way it is. Doesn't matter. So he could be the most powerful person. He could be Obama or he could be Sheikh Mohammed or he could be uh, Mr. Modi. I'll tell him exactly the way it is. How do you manage a customer relationship? Because their expectations are too high. They go pretty wild also because I know the rich and the wealthy people have got very less patience. I also know people who are wealthy but not powerful like in the king country. There are wealthy people, but they are not powerful because only one man is powerful, that is a king. <laughs> okay, I get it. <laughs> so how do you manage the temperament of your clients? Because they can be very demanding at times. And how do you protect yourself from making sure that the relationship doesn't go sour? Well, um, I think uh, I would just uh, not offend them. That's number one. You know, uh, if, if you get offended by people who come in jeans to meet with you, I will not wear jeans. So that will be number one. I will wear a suit if that's what you prefer. So I will not offend you. And, uh, but then I would not also go out of my way to please you. I don't do that. I, I feel that I'm an artist and uh, you've hired me to create something for you. Basically take your ideas and interpret them. And I will do my job. And if there is a personality conflict, I will tell you that we should part ways and we should not. So I'm not really your, um, uh, your uh, you know, I don't go out of my way. Uh, and I have yet to see a client who fired me because of that. And most of the time, I think most of them people see honesty in your eyes. And um, they come around and they tell you, yeah, this is, uh, you were right. So sometimes I think people, when they kiss up to uh, their clients, and I think it, it, uh, it works against you many times, and, uh, and you end up losing the client. When you tell them the truth, um, that it's not going to happen, um, if they come up with, I want to build this building at 250 uh, dirhams per square foot, and I look at the building, I say, it's never going to happen. They don't want to hear it, but I tell them, okay, go somewhere who will build it for you for 250 dirham, 
and then come and talk to me. So I gotten phone calls after a year and saying that you were right, I should have listened to you and things like that. So, you know, I work on a long-term basis, not on a short-term basis. Tony Design Corporation was established in 1993. How has the growth happened in so many years? Did you have to market your skills and your talent or business came to you? How did it multiply? How did you go to various countries and various continents of the world? Um, I think uh, definitely the talent uh, that we bring in. Um, what percentage of talent and what percentage of good looks? Looks? <laughs> <laughs> No, no looks at all. <laughs> so it's, uh, looks would work if all your clients were women. So <laughs> unfortunately, all my clients are men. <laughs> so I guess the looks wouldn't go. Uh, These days, even that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah that's, if you're in San Francisco, that would work. But, <laughs> but I'm in LA, so um, I definitely talent. Uh, talent and... Um, I think, you know, if you consistently do something and you do it right and you don't screw up, I think the word goes around. I mean, if I come to Bombay today and I open an office here, I consistently do good work. In about 10 years, I think everybody who is in real estate development would have heard my name. They will say, yeah, this guy does good work. It's like the same thing in Bollywood you have here. I have so many friends. There are people who are very talented but they're a bad personality and they don't want to work with them. So I think it's a combination of you have to be, uh, you have to be talented, you have to have great personality, uh, you have to be able to communicate with people, you have to be able to give people more than what they expect. I think that's been my key uh, to success. Uh, if you hire me and you're expecting I'll give you this service, when I'm done with uh, providing you service, you will tell your friends that he gave me more than a, an architect would give. Because I get involved. I get involved in everything. To the point where I've been marriage counselor between husband and wife. <laughs> you know, I mean, those are the days when I was doing houses for people. And, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, you, you are... Uh, you're working with closely with husband and wife, and uh, you find out there's a problem there. And, and then, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, when you're designing homes, you know, you get very close to, uh, to clients, and you want to, you know, you understand their whole lifestyle. And, and then you start questioning, why do they want separate bedrooms? One for him, one for him. <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, I mean, they tell you in the initial meeting he snores, so I want him. But, but the later you find out that's not the truth. So, um, so you end up becoming marriage counselor. You end up becoming a shrink a therapist. And uh, so you play all those roles. Sometimes uh, I'm in Dubai. I see all these amateur developers in Dubai. You've seen them all around. I see them all the time. And I come with 30 years of experience in architecture and construction and real estate, and I see the guy, and, and I try to advise them that, look, you know, the, either you do it this way or don't do it, you know. Um, so that's so what we do, you know. <laughs> what is your learning edge? As professionals, as entrepreneurs, we need to keep on learning. This is also one of our sessions where we learn from experienced people like you. What's your learning edge? Where do you learn from? Is it something systematic and strategic, well-planned, or it ha happens randomly? What's your learning edge? How do you learn? Google. <laughs> Google and YouTube. <laughs> when okay. I'm sitting doing nothing, I, uh, yeah, no, of course, I learn um, through travel. I learn through interacting with people. I learned a lot interacting with you in last one hour, sitting in the car in the traffic. Um, so you learn, uh, as long as your mind is open, you'll constantly learn. You know, People, worst thing that can happen to a human being is when they're prejudiced. This is the worst thing that can happen to you. I think if you want to give somebody a curse, tell them that I hope and I wish that you become prejudiced. That is the worst thing. That's like cutting his legs off. You know? So when you're not prejudiced, you're open to everything. I'm not prejudiced. Yes, I'm Kashmiri. But I'm not prejudiced against who is not Kashmiri. I'm not, you know, <laughs> which is very unlike Kashmiris, by the way. Kashmiris are very prejudiced people. So, uh, so, and I think you should be able to critique yourself, uh, you know, and you should be able to take positive cr critique from people. And if somebody says, hey, you know what, you got a problem, and uh, you should take him out for lunch and say, explain to me what my problem is. I want to understand. So that's how you learn. I think uh, if you shut them off, say, I don't like you, then you'll never learn. 
So I, a lot of times, I, and listening to people, you know, uh, I have friends who are like very powerful people, and I found out a lot of times they sit and listen. Uh, they may not like what they're hearing, but they listen. So listening to people, interacting with people, um, understanding uh, different cultures, it's a learning process. Uh, travel is a big, uh, a big learning thing. Travel is a big learning thing. And unless I am running for elections in India, I'll give you an idea, I am not going to critique your system here. If you tell me that, look, Tony, if you're going to do business here, this is the way it's done, I'm going to say, okay, let's do it that way. I'm not going to sit here and give you a lecture on morality, that you shouldn't do it this way, uh, uh, because this is your country, it's not my country. I, I didn't, you know, I chose chosen a different country. So, uh, so I'm not, so this, those are the things, you know, when you leave your mind open, you will constantly find yourself learning new things. If you might close your mind, you will never learn anything. You have done a lot of study on human psychology. How have you adapted it to your profession? Um, human behavior, I actually, I studied a lot about human behavior, but I didn't study human behavior as psychology, like a doctor. I studied human behavior as it reacts to space. Um, if this room has a ceiling of uh, 15 feet, if all of a sudden I change the design of this room and I make this 30 feet ceiling and I paint the ceiling black, would you feel the same feeling sitting in this room or would you feel differently? Um, if uh, these walls were a different color or this flooring was different texture, if this carpet wasn't red, it was green, would it give different energy? So I have learned through my studies that, uh, that everything has an impact on energy. And that energy, like these two bottles sitting over here, if we remove those two bottles, it'll create a completely different energy over here. So I believe that uh, human behavior, so when, once you understand human behavior, how it reacts to things, um, a simple example I give you, when you see a big park, open park, uh, you, uh, if you see people standing over there, they will always stand with their back towards a wall or towards a light pole, uh, they, because human psychology, they want to be safe from behind, somebody might attack you, even though nobody will attack you. Um, so when you understand human psychology and human behavior space, so now you reverse it, now I'm designing a space. So I would design a space to make you feel like how I want you to feel. If I want you to, if you're my client, you say, Tony, design my house, I want people to open the door and their jaws should drop. They should go, Wow. So I would design you a space where people would open the door and their jaws would drop. If you say, I want people to come into my home, and when they open the door, they should be humbled, or they should, be, they should feel peaceful, and they should feel happy, joyous, but not intimidated, then I would design you a space. So now I have to think of ceiling heights, colors, volume, proportion of the space. So all this put together, it's like magic. It works, just like it works in movies, just like it works in opera. When you're watching a big screen, you know it's not reality, but you're crying, tears are coming out of your eyes. And it works in space planning as well. You can create space that could intimidate you or that could humble you. So, um, so when I did my thesis on this whole thing in uh, University of New York, my final project was a design which I chose myself. So I said, what would I, now I've learned this human, how would I implement, what would be the project? So I chose a designing office for God. For? God. Okay. Uh, so God's my client. So God tells me, design an office for me. So how would you design an office for God? So, uh, so I had to play all these games. So if you walk in God's office, what do you expect to see? And uh, where would God be sitting? Would you be able to see him or would you not be able to see him? Is he raised or is he down below? Uh, so you walk in. So I designed this whole God's office, um, you know, where you come in and there's a series of spaces you go through and you can hear God and God says, uh, 
Rajesh come inside, and, but you cannot see him. And you go through these spaces, which creates the suspense in your mind. And then you finally meet God. And when you meet God, you kind of bow down and you say, okay, you're God. You kind of accept. So that whole process was interesting for me. And I still apply that in space planning. So every time you think, you rerun that same theory and you start creating space in every space that you're building. Yes. I actually uh, design space. Uh, any building I design is a series of spaces. Uh, like you're running a camera through the space. If you are walking, you're looking to the right, what do you see? Uh, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's like a screenplay of a movie, which is being opened in front of you. And I think you have applied all of this in your beautiful large house facing the sea in California. Uh, and your house doesn't have a dead end. That's None of the house has a dead end. You watch a lot of videos, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I said in the beginning, I know more about you than your wife does. Yeah, that's, oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very interesting. And I, for the first time, came across a concept where it says that not to have any dead ends. It leads to somewhere else. And you have uh, really used the, uh, the slope of the mountain well. And you have created multiple courtyards so that whenever people come from whichever side, they feel greeted and they feel good about the space that's been created. Yeah. I'm sure every architect, ha every architect has his own creative way of thinking. This probably is yours. And well, it's like uh, a movie. You know, when you watch a movie, you don't want to watch the movie going backwards again. So I feel like if you're walking in a space, you've seen it. You should go on moving to the next space so you don't need to come back. So I personally do not like dead-end corridors. I don't. Whenever I have a corridor or something, I need to have a door, a staircase going down, connecting to a garden, then going up there and put a bridge up there. And so it's like interesting spaces, interesting experience. So that's what you try to create in every creation that you have. Every, everywhere, yeah. It is said that if you're an Italian, you're a good Italian architect. But you're not an Italian and still you're considered to be one of the best Italian architects in the world. Tuscan architects and Italian architects in the world. So is it necessary that you need to be a no. German for being a good engineer? No. Is it necessary to be an Italian to be a good architect in it, Italian design? What is it? What is your philosophy about uh, creativity, art and the business of imagination? The, I'll give you an example. The best pizza made in New York is made by a Mexican. He's not Italian. So <laughs> you really, d uh, <laughs> and, a lot of it, and his, most of his customers are Italian. So, uh, uh, so it doesn't really mean anything. I could get you, a, there's a restaurant in London, and the chef is French, and he makes the best Indian food. And everybody goes to that restaurant, uh, including Shah Rukh Khan's and everybody of the world. And they want to eat Indian food prepared by this uh, French chef. So I believe that, um, that uh, th there is no such thing as, uh, as uh, you know, you have to be an Indian to do Indian thing. I believe uh, an American can become as good an Indian designer of shalwar kameez for women uh, as an Indian. Uh, Manish Malhotra, they could beat Manish Malhotra and could become the best uh, Indian outfit designer. Or Manish Malhotra could become the best uh, dress, uh, Western dress designer. So I don't think there is anything like, uh, like that. You know? So one last question from me before we begin with the audience. My last question is, what inspires Tony Ashai? What keeps him alive, ticking and making sure that he beats his performance of yesterday? Um, you know, actually, things that inspire me are strange. You know, a lot of times uh, I get inspired by uh, not necessarily very, very successful people. I get inspired by uh, people um, who are underdogs. Like when I see a guy, I'll give you an idea, uh, example. I have a guy in Dubai. He is, uh, he, I hired him to cook for me. But he wanted to become a driver. And uh, <laughs> his name is uh, Yusuf. And he failed 26 times in his driving test. And his salary was 3,000 dirhams. And every time he failed, he had to pay 2,600 dirham fees wow. for another exam. And I thought this guy will give up, but he didn't give up. Finally, he became a driver. So now he's my driver. And, uh, 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 and, and, these, and these are the people that inspire me. I see them everywhere. I see people who you meet here. You, there could be a person here, and everybody would tell him. And it happened to me. When I started my company, I used to work with an architect 
in L.A. And he told me, what are you going to do? Why are you quitting? I said, I'm going to start my own firm. He said, you know, you, I don't think you will be successful in this business. I'm like, why? He says, most Americans would not hire a guy who came from India. And, you know, they're a little bit of prejudice. And so I just looked at him. I said, what about the immigrants, you know, <laughs> who are here? <laughs> There's a lot of uh, Chinese, Indians, Koreans. Maybe I'll start with them. Uh, but he was wrong. A majority of the people that hired me were American. So everything people tell you is completely wrong. They're lying to you. They're giving you wrong information. You could be, you could be the ugliest man in the world and become the most superstar in Bollywood or Hollywood. And you could be a fat, overweight woman and become a, a fashion uh, walk diva. diva on it. So this, there's really. This, this is completely untrue when people say that. So I get inspired by underdogs. Like I watch movies, I sit there, I cry when I see Rocky Balboa go and beat that guy. And he was not supposed to beat him. So those are the things that inspire me. People like that. Fantastic. One last question. I cannot stop without asking that question. Uh, Tony, you have done a lot for the urban people of the world. You have done a lot for the wealthy people of the world. What are your plans for doing something with your talent and your experience that you have got over the last 30 years? What are your plans for the economically challenged people? They also deserve a good house. What are your plans for them? Um, yeah, I've been, you know, I've been so busy in the last 30 years. Study, honestly, I've never gotten time to think, but it's been in the back of my mind. <clears throat> um, want to create something for uh, low-cost housing, where people are, you know, affordable housing. And uh, till now, tell you honestly, I have not really gone into that thing. Uh, but if I put my mind to it, I'm sure I can come up with something. Uh, but I believe that if I ever do anything, uh, which I discuss with you, uh, I don't believe in, I, believe, I don't believe in uh, just building a house for them. I want to see as house, like if I'm doing something in, in, in a village, I want to probably do a research on what is the local material they use, uh, what is the local craftsman, so it would also provide employment to them while we're building. So I'm against, I'm against uh, building an affordable house in, let's say, Chennai and bringing the material from China. You know, I, I don't believe in that. I believe that if you're doing social service, affordable, they might as well do all the way and then use the local talent, use the local material, use the local know-how, provide the employment, and maybe use the local people and improve their talent a little bit. So create like human resource and all this other stuff, so small cottage industries. I've had discussions with a lot of uh, politicians here in India, and, um, and maybe we'll do something soon. Maybe we'll do something together. 100%. <laughs> yeah. I think that was phenomenal. Can we all? Applaud for this lovely human being, Tony Ashai. Thank you. Uh, the questions are open and we can start asking. Yes, Vivek. Hi. I think you so should hold it here. That way it won't make noise. Sure. Okay, thank you. So the most beautiful spot in uh, Mumbai is our Queen's Necklace because of the Art Deco buildings and all of them the same height. But we owe that to the British which was done a long time ago. Uh, what do you say about uh, Dubai and the skyline in Mumbai with the buildings you know, of all different heights and sizes and looks? What is your opinion about that? Uh, should there be rules to give uh, the city a more uniform look? Um, well, uh, you know, it's all... Um, I don't know if you know zoning ordinances. In every city there are zoning ordinances. And zoning ordinances in the past were derived from the width of the road. So if the road was a certain width and the buildings can be certain height. But now we are working on a completely different zoning pattern. It's called, uh, it's called uh, mass-based zoning. It's like uh, we, we designed the mass first and we designed the skyline now. You know, it's form-based, sorry, form-based zoning. So uh, we, now what we do is we would, we would come up with uh, different forms that we want, so the skyline is designed up front. So in Bombay, it'll be very difficult to change the skyline now unless they change the zoning and all these buildings get demolished. But, uh, you know, Dubai is a very brand new city. It's less than 20 years old city. Um, and the skyline was predetermined, was predesigned by the master planners. 
Here, there was no skyline that was designed. Here, they just did zoning, ground plus six-story buildings, and they designed the facades. So at that point, I don't think skyline was even discussed back in probably 20s or 30s when Britishers did the master planning of Bombay. But now you see over here in Juhu and Andheri, you know, you are developing skyline. So I really don't know what to tell you other than that. Thank you. Sure. Next question. Yes, Archana. Hi, Tony. Nice to meet you. Uh, you said something about your creativity and, you know, your science of space. And in India, we have something called Vashtu Shastra, which is also followed by a lot of people. Yes. Do you uh, believe spirituality in spaces gives design, or do you feel Vastu Shastra is a science that is true? Well, I've done a lot of research on Vastu Shastra, and I've also done research on Feng Shui, the Chinese uh, thing. So when I was studying for human behavior, so I had to study all these uh, old uh, 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 functions that people used to use. I uh, came across, uh, when I was doing my studies, I found out that Vastu um, Shastriya was designed for uh, great hygiene and, uh, you know, like your entry has to be from the south because the sun is on that side and kitchen has to be in a certain area where the sun comes and kills the bacteria. So there is a lot of science behind Vastu. Now, when it comes to the point where if you put your bathroom or master bedroom on top of kitchen, you're going to get sick and all this other stuff. I think those are fair tactics used in the old uh, days. Uh, so you don't build a bedroom, bedroom on top of a kitchen because of, there might be a fire. So instead of telling you, look, you know, there could be a fire and you could burn in your bedroom, you may not be able to get out. So they created a scenario where you could uh, lose your first child if you build that over there. Or you could, um, you could get sick. Uh, if you build your bathroom, like in feng shui, if you build a bathroom at the entry, you will get sick all the time. They just didn't want bathrooms at the entry. So, <laughs> but how do you tell people, you know, because back then there were no municipal codes and building codes, and then how do you tell people? So you use scare tactic. But having said that, there are other things in vastu and, uh, and feng shui. Like, for example, when you open the door to a room, uh, feng shui says, as well as Vastu says, if you walk in from that door and this is my office, you should be able to see my face right away. Not my side or not my back. So that's the right Vastu and right Feng Shui. So my desk can only be facing this way. So you come in that way and you see my face. And I think it has a great impact in, in your behavior when people come in and psychologically, if I'm sitting like this and you walk in, and I have to turn like this, it gives you a completely different impression of me. So all these things, like even the bed, you know, a bed headboard has to be, cannot be in the same wall as the door. So you, when you open the door, you see the feet. You want to see the head of the headboard. So there is a lot of science to it. There is a lot of uh, human behavior uh, studies in it. And there's a lot of uh, intimidation techniques in it. So uh, I, would, I would rule out intimidation techniques where it says your son will get sick or you will die or you will get uh, divorced. Uh, you know, like for example, uh, <laughs> a feng shui says that if there's a beam in the ceiling in the middle of the room and you have a bed underneath, that husband wife will have problems in their marriage. <laughs> so I, I don't believe that. that. Those are the things I have difficulty with. I've, first of all, I say, I would say it'll give me a headache if there's a beam in the middle and I'm sleeping and I'm looking at the beam. So, yes, there is some truth to it, some uh, intimidation, made up stuff, but overall, I think it's a good thing. In the lack of when there is no regulation, I think Vastu is a good thing to follow. Rohit, yes. Hi, Tony. You've been fabulous. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one thing is they say that they, the form should follow the function. Uh, but many times the designs are seen where the designs have a lot of aesthetic value and functionally they are not you know, up to the mark. So what's your take on this? And the second question is about the relationship management. You have been straightforward with people. So did you have ever an incident where 
you been straight forward and you know the other person got pissed off and he snapped the ties and if that had happened how did you reconcile it thank you um first of all um what was the first question i'm sorry i forgot follow <laughs> function huh regarding form oh, yeah, follow yeah, function form, yeah yeah so um i'm a strong believer function is more important than form um i believe that uh I don't believe that form should dictate the function. And there's a lot of examples to prove me right. If you go and see a lot of buildings that are that look like a tire or look like a ship or look like a uh, a shoe or something like that, there's a lot of compromise on space planning on that because you have you're rigid in this form. And the most common word you'll hear from developers, I want my building to be iconic. and i tell everybody if every building is iconic then no building is iconic you know what i'm saying like honestly i had so many clients in dubai everybody wants his building iconic i said okay i used to scare them i said iconic building will cost twice to build are you ready to spend and no uh, we want to spend half the money so okay well we'll try our best to make it functional so you can sell and example is in Dubai because it's our recent example of development. Dubai is a perfect case study for all architects, urban designers and everything else because it happened in the last 20 years. There's a place called JLT Jumeirah Lake Towers. There are many towers built there. There's one tower, the rate of sale is 1400 dirhams per square foot. There's a tower next to it, 900 dirhams per square foot. And you wonder why? And it's because the guy next to it tried to force the shape of the building on the floor plan and then when you go into these apartments you cannot put bed anywhere the walls a little bit curved furniture is always rectangular most of the time so okay. you're talking about the twisted building i am not going to name any buildings okay. but I, i'm just i'm just i'm just going to i'm just going to say give you an example then there are buildings that look very simple on outside they're not they're not iconic they don't look like a telescope they don't look like a tire but when you go inside the space plan is beautiful bedrooms are right size there's a wall where you can put the bed there's a wall you can put sofa somebody's thought about it so i'm a strong believer in in function um, should lead not form form should not lead form should come after but at the same time if you are a good architect you can achieve both you don't have to compromise on form you can achieve both but but in the front is function that was and the second uh, question what was the second question you had <coughs> something about uh, suppose because of your straight forward nature yeah, yeah. you have snapped ties no, with the client nobody how so have far. you reconciled nobody has uh, i haven't snapped ties um i have been very straight forward but i make sure that i'm not offensive uh if i call somebody and i want to tell him that uh, that your breath stinks i would uh, probably tell him in a in a room where there's nobody else listening to it so i'll take him to the side i'll say your breath stinks or you have body odor you know go uh, wash yourself uh i won't humiliate him in front of others so most people appreciate most people appreciate honesty um people may not like you immediately but in the long run people appreciate honesty lovely sidhu we'll take three more questions after this question good evening sir hi uh, you have been uh, designing a uh, houses for all luxurious uh, people all luxury houses uh, my question to you is how important is luxury for a common man because uh, they are not uh, much uh, into spending money for luxury so what difference it makes and how should we start adapting to uh, spending money <laughs> <laughs> well well a common man i think his requirement is a roof under uh, you know under over his head and uh, a proper clean hygienic proper space planned uh, apartment to live in or a house to live in uh, i think luxury is something um, there has no limit uh, everybody you meet a guy who you think is filthy rich um and he's bought a rolex watch and then you meet another guy he looks at that rolex watch and laughs he says who wears rolex watches these days I got Patek Philippe Patek over here and then you meet another guy says who wears that you know and then you have a guy who has uh, a Rolls Royce and Bentley then you meet another guy he has an airplane they meet another guy he has a fleet of airplanes so this there's uh, luxury has no limit i i think um i think uh, so uh, as far as designing for luxury it's better for me 
because I have a free hand. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Uh, budget is never a limit. Uh, but it should be very challenging. I haven't done low-cost housing. I haven't done uh, affordable housing. So I really don't know what it's like. But I'm sure it'll be a good challenge to take one day. Hemal, yes. Sir, how has your the design sense changed over the years? Like uh, before 10 years, how was your design sense? Today, how is the design sense? And how, you, how do you keep it fresh? As, how do you keep your ideas fresh and to the mark and to the what is going on in the trend? Or you make the trends yourself? Um, good question. Um, I, uh, unfortunately, like I told you before, architects are commissioned artists. That means uh, when somebody hires me, pays my fees, what I ask him, he already has a lot of preconceived notions. So he'll come to me, and generally the client is a real estate developer. And in just like in fashion, um, architecture also has a, a design phase that's going on. In the last 10 years, everybody was doing Tuscany architecture. Like, no matter where you go, I want pitch roof, I want columns, arches. Four or five years back, people started changing towards modern contemporary. Now I want a lot of glass, I want clean lines, I want minimal, I want no any detail. I believe it has to do with, um, uh, with uh, generations, a generation change. It's like me, I don't want to wear clothes that my father used to wear. And that my son doesn't want to look like me. He wants to wear something else. So every 15, 20 years, people want to change. If, if my father had a Tuscany house or a colonial style house, I want opposite of that. I want modern house because this defines me. Now, my generation defines modern, the next year. So as an architect, if you're going from generation, of course you have to adjust to these styles. And just because I'm a commissioned artist, he comes to me, he goes, Tony, my clients, my customers want Spanish architecture. That's in fashion. So I make the best Spanish architecture. My preference is minimalist architecture. If I had to do something for me today, I would do completely like a naked body, no clothes. This is what I would do today. But I didn't do that 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I would put a lot of clothes and jewelry and everything. Today, at the age of 51, I would, if I was designing a human being, I would design a completely naked human being. One last question, Praveen. Yeah, uh, evening. After 30 years of your career, are you more an artist or a businessman? Um, I, I will always be an artist. I don't think I will ever die uh, as a businessman. I mean, business is something uh, that is a necessary evil. You know, what are you going to do? If you are, uh, you know, my father told me one time, he says, you could be the best architect in the world, but if you don't build any building, you're useless. Nobody knows about you. So in order to get to that point where people hire you or you develop, because I have also gone into real estate development. Um, I got, one time I got sick of these developers. I said, if this developer comes to me, asks me to create something for him, what does he have that I don't have? Money. So I said, okay, I'll find somebody who has money. So I went and found somebody who had money. I said, you put your money in, I will develop it, and we'll create amazing architecture. Then I found out that it's a lot more complicated than just simply putting <laughs> money together. You know. And I lost my shirt on that. And, uh, and then I back, back, I said, okay, wait a minute, this is now my cup of tea. So let them do, because, you know, in business, when you're doing business, there is, you have to do sales. So when you're doing sales, a lot of times you have to say even what you don't believe in to make the sales happen. As an artist, you won't do that. As an artist, you will say exactly what's in your mind. So there's a conflict between an artist and a businessman. So if you are an entrepreneur and a businessman, who is not an artist, you have a lot more chances of succeeding versus if you're an artist and an entrepreneur, you have a lot more chances of failing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Varajesh. Yeah, good evening, Tony, sir. It was an excellent learning. Uh, my only question which I ask most of the people who have been extraordinarily successful is that with so much of knowledge and so much of information, so much of talent, whatever you acquired, what are you doing to inherit to the next generation, how would you make assured that this kind of a legacy will be followed for a much longer time? Any steps been taken for this kind of a thing? 
Um, you know, I just turned 50, so <laughs> I was busy making money. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's definitely on the cards. I have a friend who is a ruler of a country, and with him I'm starting a school, a design school. Um, and uh, we came uh, up with this idea that, uh, that a lot of uh, Muslim girls from, uh, from Middle East uh, they have a lot of talent. They are uh, designers by birth, but they don't go become designers because they don't go to design schools. Most good design schools are in Europe or in America, and the parents don't let them travel there. So we came up with the idea, what if we bring some of those design schools and open them in Dubai or UAE, where a lot of these, and exclusively for women, girls so the girls can come in and then become graphic designers, architects, interior designers, fashion designers. So we're working on that concept and uh, inshallah we'll put that together very soon. Very difficult and uh, what that means is that you don't get any sleep <laughs> and uh, you know with today's technology Skype, FaceTime, I mean you're practically there, you get tablets. I have tablets that I sit and uh, you know, use digitizer pen, I mark up and say send, it goes to my architect in Dubai, I could be in LA, he gets it, he's on Skype, he opens, he looks at it, he goes, yeah, I like this, I don't like it, so communication, you know, uh, I think today's world is much easier to do than before, but yeah, there comes a point where you can't grow beyond that point, and that's the problem with service industry, and I think we reach that point, then you stop, then you know, you go beyond, then they become a factory. And, and a lot of bad stuff starts coming out of your office. So I tried not to grow that big. Yeah, the last question for the evening. Thank you, Mr. Suhas. Yeah. Hi, Tony. Hi. Uh, since you have been uh, traveling uh, all over and you have designed many things, you know, buildings, and I would like to understand when we started, we were starting about the FSI. What, tell us about what countries, what cities, has what kind of FSI systems and secondly you tell about the cities itself you know you describe the cities whatever you have worked to in and you have visited and describe in very short year how what is the city Miss one of our um, you know you, uh, you mean the process of getting things approved and things like that or no no FSI that's a no, yeah. process I can understand it could be faster in Dubai it could be slower in uh, Mumbai, he wants to understand FSI of various cities yeah. and some speciality of that city, right? Not speciality. The, describe those cities which you have traveled and you have visited, you have worked in a uh, few words. Like impersonal cities yeah. and uh, okay. aggressive cities or Character of the city. Like character. character of the city. Yes. Well, the, if, you, if you start from the oldest city, which uh, I think is one of the best uh, places to learn about architecture is Florence, Italy. Uh, Florentine uh, architecture um, is uh, the birthplace of what we do today. I mean, they made the Domo, was the first dome they built there. So um, I always love to go to Florence. I mean, there's so much you can learn over there. From master planning, designing urban spaces, to piazzas, to vistas that connect to, between piazzas, and the facades of the buildings and courtyards, and uh, there's so much to learn. That's uh, Florence, a beautiful city. Uh, Venice, amazing city, completely different concept. Water, uh, bodies, and everything else. So Dubai, like uh, for example, Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a city which is a, a motor vehicle city. It's a car city. So it's 80 miles, almost 100 kilometers by 100 kilometer city. So uh, you could be living in LA, you never meet people. And even though you could be your brother, you would say, you know, you're B I would never have to take an airplane to come to you. So uh, it's designed around, air, uh, around car mobility, so it's spread out city, it's a low spread out city. New York City, Manhattan, surrounded by water, you could only that big island, so the only place it could go was vertical, so it went vertically, so it creates these big canyons, and uh, New York City is, um, is uh, if it didn't have Central Park, it would be the worst city to live in the world, it would be New York City. Paris, on the other hand, is a beautiful city. Uh, you have uh, big Champs-Élysées, big open spaces. At the same time, you have uh, amazing art centers, museums, Louvre's, and uh, Musée d'Orsay. 
Dubai, I don't know what to think of Dubai. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Dubai, I think, I think Dubai is a city that I, don't, I think it's too early to pass a judgment on that city yet. I think I have to wait probably another 20 years and see how it evolves. Um, it's too new. 20 years back, there was nothing there. And all this happened. So I think we wait and see how it... I mean, they're doing definitely a great job. Uh, all entire Dubai is designed around form-based zoning. So you don't have zonings like here, FSI. So in Dubai, you can have one plot different FSI, another plot different FSI, and right next to because that is how the master planner envisioned this building will be 30 story, this one will be 20 story, so different FSI. Um, and uh, it's definitely, uh, um, I would say Dubai is a good case study for planners in India. I would say planners in India should go to Dubai and understand Dubai's planning of new areas like Jumeirah Lake Towers, Marina, Jumeirah Beach Residences. So it, it's a good, uh, it's so close go and see and study and then come back and see if you can do something uh, uh, like that over here. Um, I, of course, I, um, I love my city where I come from, Srinagar. It's a medieval city, pre-Jesus era city. It's one of the oldest cities in this area. Um, and, um, and I love, um, uh, I, I don't much care about Bombay. I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think it's, um, I, I mean, Bombay has, has its, uh, uh, pluses and uh, and minuses, but I think minuses way over uh, power the pluses. So, <laughs> so uh, there is a lot of scope, Tony. There's a lot of scope. Yeah, there's a lot of scope. <laughs> I, the thing, like, I don't understand in India why don't people paint buildings? I I don't get that, you know. And people, all the paints run off from all the buildings. <laughs> and I'm thinking because I didn't practice architecture in India, even though I'm from here. Uh, I'm thinking the reason probably is there is a thing called primer. When you paint concrete, you use a bonding material called primer, and then you put paint. I have a feeling people here don't know that there is a thing called primer. So they probably use water-based paint on cement, and the next monsoon, all the paint comes off. So maybe somebody should just introduce primer here, and that the paint will <laughs> stick <laughs> to the wall. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, this, those are some of the cities, my favorite cities. So sorry friends, the questions are over. We, can we all clap for him? Oh. <laughs> that was awesome, Tony. We had Thank a you. very lovely session.